Welcome to Play for Keeps, a presentation of Ashland New Plays Festival. This play is the property of the playwright who reserves all rights to its use. This recording is the property of Ashland New Plays Festival, Inc., which reserves all rights to its use. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Naming True, a play by Natalie Simons. Characters. Amy Holt, 19. Caucasian transgender female. Amy's worldly awareness should not be mistaken for sentimentality. Amy is not a wilting flower or meek teenage girl, but rather a willful young woman who is unapologetic in her quest to find answers, never maudlin or sheepish in her pursuit. The possible pitfall will be to play the purity of her truth. Resist this and rather understand the regret, hurt, and muted anger at her core. Amy's lived her entire life fighting to be seen as she sees herself. This is compounded by the guilt over her mother, which in turn has caused her to question life in a way that is far beyond her young age. Nell Jordan, 39, African-American, cisgender female. Whip-smart, quick-tongued, rarely loses a fight. In imagining Nell, think of a woman who, under a different set of circumstances, might have achieved greatness. She is highly intelligent, and even when claiming otherwise, she is not dumb to this fact. Nell, although deeply wounded, does not see herself as a victim and never, under any circumstances, indulges in self-pity. Nell, like Amy, is plagued by guilt and regret. While she's aware that she's a victim of injustice, what disturbs her more is that she and her brother are prisoners of their response to injustice. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder, of spring over distant mountains, he who was living is now dead. We who are living are now dying with a little patience. T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland, 5, What the Thunder Said. I am of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man. Setting. Room number 10 at Hills Lodge Motel, on the Oklockney River, Panhandle of Florida. The action takes place over the course of 24 hours. October, the present. The space is the living room area of a rundown motel room. There is a bed, a small bureau, and a desk with a large screen laptop. Next to the laptop is a stack of old yellowed notebook papers and ripped up paper grocery bags. There is a plethora of glossy-covered books piled around the room. In some instances, they tower waist-high. In the corner sits an empty cat litter box, a mangled cat toy, and a bowl. There is a kitchen area upstage, a bathroom off left. Scene 1, Early Morning. Daybreak. In the blackout, we hear a television news broadcast. The sound fades during the broadcast as the lights come up. Well, yeah, folks. It looks like the pressure has dropped enough to qualify this tropical storm as a Category 1 hurricane. We are now recording sustained winds at 76 miles per hour. Spaghetti models show all but one track headed right up around the Florida Panhandle and just north of the Florida-Georgia state line. We are definitely expecting this storm to intensify to at least a Category 3 if the current model holds. Coastal areas can expect a significant storm surge with this one, as landfall will coincide with the Proxigian spring tide. If anyone needs any shelter, please contact... At rise, Nell, wearing jeans and a bra, sits at the desk typing on the laptop. She refers to a pile of old papers and torn-up grocery bags that sits on the desk next to the computer. She turns the yellowed page. She types, slowly, stopping periodically to claw at her skin, scratching wildly. 
thunder is heard in the far distance. Amy, rain-drenched, appears in the open door with a suitcase and an oversized purse strapped over her shoulder. She watches Nell for a moment. She tentatively knocks and steps into the room. Nell Jordan? <gasps> Holy shit! Oh my god, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Who the you. hell are you? I'm Amy. Who? Amy Holt. I'm your book coordinator. What? Your book coordinator from Writer House. We've been emailing back and forth about self-publishing your book. What? What are you doing here? I was going to call... Sneaking up on a person like that? I'm indisposed, girl. I'm sorry. The door is open, so because I... Because I'm waiting on someone. I'm sorry. I, I should have called, but my, my phone was dying. Nell puts on a sweatshirt. Where'd you come from? Seattle. How'd you know where I was? Well, you told me when you called. When you called, remember? You told me where you were. Bumfuck Florida. I never called. We was emailing. Yes, you did. You come here all the way from Seattle. I always wanted to visit Florida. I think I might have that thing where the the weather makes you melancholy, so I think the you sun... You telling me you came 3,000 miles because you got the blues? My, my mom thought it was because I was born on a Wednesday, so I'm... Full of woe. <laughs> you know, the nursery rhyme? How'd you know where to find me? You said something about the angels on the sign outside? And the number came up on my cell. I called back and got some guy at the front desk. You better tell me what's going on here. Well, I took a bus, and then I hitched. I got caught in the storm. But I took a bus. I didn't ask a bunch about of no bus. bus. I asked what you're doing here. This one dude on the bus from Atlanta was watching porn on his phone. and He was like full on. And the weird thing is that no one said anything. Just what is it you don't understand about what the fuck are you doing here? I needed to see you in person. Thought this was a long distance thing. Thought that's how this works. Oh, it is. It does. Thought you were going to get my book on the interwebs. Didn't know had to be in person for that shit. N no, I know. Uh, you don't. I sent the deposit. Amy takes money out of her pocket. It's wet from the rain. She offers it to Nell. Here. What you giving it to me for? I can't keep it. I don't want it. But I can't keep it. That's $535 cash money. That's my deposit. Gonna pay the rest when I finish typing. Don't worry about it. Here, take it. Can't type fast like you kid. But just take it. I I don't work for Writer's House anymore. I, I think I might have gotten fired. What are you talking about? I can explain. Damn right you're gonna explain. Amy searches for words. She can't find them. Explain, goddammit, before I call the police. Please, no, wait. How about we start over? I paid Ryder House my deposit to publish my book. Now I'm about to get up in someone's ass about this. I understand, this. but Told that's... Told them I don't know nothing about these goddamn computers and U-pads. iPads? Or any of this Please crap. I had a U-pad. iPad. But I just needed a normal fucking computer that had a keyboard, not one you gotta purchase separately. An iPad has a keypad. It's a touchscreen. Well, I didn't see no touchscreen, so I put it back and took this one. What do you mean you took it? From where? From some kid in one of them Starbucks joints. You stole it? The kid wasn't doing nothing except screwing around with a computer game when he went to take a piss. You just took it? He asked me to watch it. So I watched it. <laughs> Shit. What I'm trying to tell you, if you'd stopped interrupting, is I ain't got a handle on this computer crap. That's why I got Writer House to do the publishing shit. Self-publishing. Next thing Can I, I know, I got some nut job at my door talking about some masturbator in a fucking nursery room. Listen, I You got a lot of goddamn nerve. Can't publish it. What? Why? Because I don't know what to do. Then why are you working for a publishing company? No, I know how to do that. I just didn't know what to do after I talked to you because of what you said on the phone. You don't remember? Don't remember shit about no call. Told me about your brother. What'd I say? You really don't remember? 
any of it? I was probably half in a bag, girl. You said your brother Truman called him True with an E. He got 50 years, no parole. Told me he didn't have no chance in life. Told me you prayed, but it didn't do so good. What you talking about true for? Well, you said he... Don't you be standing there getting up in my business. You told me as soon as... That when your manuscript was published that... Said you were ready. Said you were ready to die. I told you that? So I just got on the bus and I didn't think much about it. It just sort of happened. You shouldn't be here, girl. Why do you want to kill yourself? You got no idea what you walked into here. Listen, Miss Jordan. Nell. Can I call you Nell? Believe you just did. If you're depressed, I got some experience with that. This ain't your business. Well, then whose is it? Sort of figured it was mine. You can't do this. You don't know what you're talking about, girl. Yes, I do. And I'm sorry, but I can't. I'm not going to be a part of this. Part of what? Suicide. Yours. Who said anything about suicide? You did. You said after you publish your ebook, you're you going to. You shouldn't have come here, kid. Why do you want it published so badly anyway? I mean, if you don't care about anyone reading I it. I said I don't want no one reading it. But I mean, if you're just going to kill yourself, God why. God damn it, you got to publish it. It's true. My brothers, it's. Our story, and I gotta tell it. You mean it's a memoir? Get the hell out of my room. What? I said get the fuck out. Okay, okay. Ugh, look, I'm sorry, but can we at least the... The storm is supposed to get really bad. You should have thought about that before you got on that bus with the masturbator. Wait, just please don't. I, I can't leave. Not yet. We hear the low murmur of a television coming from the motel room next door. Hey! Turn it the fuck down, Wanda! I got a visitor! <laughs> Take it you don't have many visitors. Don't get along with folks. Uh, looks like you might go out of your way to not get along. Trust me, it ain't out of my way. Ugh, look at this place. Does anyone even know you're here? When I got here, you said you was waiting for someone who? For T.S. Pardon? T.S., my cat. T.S. as in the poet? As in the cat. He run away? She'll be back. How long has she been gone? Two months. That's, uh, kind of a long time. She'll come back when she's ready. Amy spies the litter box, bowl, and threadbare toy in the corner of the room. Is that kind of a lonesome sight? What the fuck? Lonesome? Melancholy? You like some Jane Austen bitch. Well, her bowl and litter box sitting there is, I don't know, lonely. Ain't no litter box. Well, it looks like No a... one's taking a crap in a box in here. That's nasty, girl. Cat can use the toilet just like everyone else. Are you kidding? How'd you train her to use the toilet? I pointed to the toilet and said, that's where you shit. She can, like, flush the toilet? No, she can't fucking flush it. She's a cat. Maybe the rain will make her come home. <laughs> she ain't afraid of a little rain. First storm of the season in this swamp land, and she like, bitch, I'll see you later. Wow. I'll leave a little water in the box so she can fuck around in there. <laughs> she walks over and picks up the tattered cat toy. Uh, what's this thing? Hey, hey, don't touch my shit. You've been on that nasty bus with some masturbator. Who knows what you picked up? Go wash your hands. The guy jerking off in all these people's heads on the back of seats and their filthy fingers on the windows. But <laughs> you live in a motel room. Sorry, I just... I assume a lot of people have slept in that bed. What you think? You think I didn't wash the sheets? Huh? No, I'm... I gave this shithole a thorough scrub down, even got a handle on the cockroach situation. Cockroach? Nell pounds on the wall. Amy jumps. Turn down that motherfucking TV! Don't look so spooked. Told you I got them roaches under control. Got applesauce under the sink. Applesauce. It's non-toxic. 
and it don't cost an arm and a leg like them roach motels Wanda and Eleven snuffs them with. Now go on, wash your hands, and change your clothes, you dripping. Pardon? On the floor. Oh, sorry. Well, don't just stand there like a drowned rat. Go put on some dry clothes. Bathroom's right there. So I can stay? Didn't say you could stay. Said you could change. There's a clean towel in there. Amy kneels. She opens her suitcase and takes out dry clothes. She looks up at Nell, who sits at the desk, looking at the stack of papers and grocery bags. Amy follows Nell's gaze. Is that... Is that what you want published? Are those grocery bags? Why'd you use bags? Just go. Amy stands with her dry clothes and exits to the bathroom. Oh my God, there's a roach in here. Well, don't start screaming like a sissy. Show it the applesauce under the sink. Oh my God, that's so disgusting. Well, it's better than them roach motels. Amy runs out of the bathroom. Did you wash your hands? No, there's a roach in there. I told you to show it the applesauce. Nell storms into the bathroom. Where is it? It went behind the toilet. We hear an excessive amount of crashing around in the bathroom. After a moment, Nell emerges from the bathroom, holding a toilet plunger. Now go change. Amy exits to the bathroom. Lights fade. End of scene. Scene two, a few minutes later. Nell is standing just outside the open motel door, illuminated by the flashing neon sign for Hills Lodge Motel. Amy exits the bathroom. She sees Nell outside. She dials her cell phone. I'm here, Grandpa. I'm here in Florida. At Hills Lodge Motel. Can you hear me? Ugh, the connection is bad. Grandpa, wait. Ugh, my phone is dying. Wait, I'll call you back. Nell comes inside. Amy hangs up. Would you mind if I charge my phone? Nell shrugs and I don't give a shit. Amy takes her cell phone charger from her purse and plugs it into an outlet. She notices the large quantity of books in the room. Did you read all these books? Most. Just because I'm a drunk don't mean I'm a dope. Are they all from the library? Most of them. Aren't some of them overdue? I suppose. You forgot to return them? I forgot to check them out. You always been a reader? Gave me somewhere to go when I was in hell. Amy picks up a book and opens it. What are you doing? Don't, don't do that. Don't touch my things. Oh, sorry. You're making I... me uneasy snooping around like... Sorry, I didn't mean to. I just... I don't like people up in my shit. Don't like people. Don't get along with no one but the cat. But he ran away. She. So? So I guess maybe you don't get along with her as much as you think. Sorry. That was a bad joke. You think you're pretty clever, don't you, girl? It was just a joke, sorry. Because you see things from both sides. Been a boy and a girl, so you think you're pretty special, huh? What? Think just because you and your mama made a big show on television that you got it all figured out. So, you watched it? <laughs> I ain't never watched no reality TV program. None of it? Want to watch enough TV for everyone in this hellhole. So you never watched it? Any of it? What, you got wax in your ears? I said I ain't seen it. What? How much more money you want? I, I already told you I don't want your money. How much it take to get you to do it? Publish my manuscript. I can't. Oh, I assure you, you can, and you will. I already told you I'm not going to be a part of this. It's not your job to keep me from making friends with the devil. To deliver me from some fiery hell? I already been in hell, and this ain't it. This here at Hills Lodge Motel is my own private purgatory, where them angels on that neon sign is keeping vigil, waiting for me to die. Well, then why don't you just do it and get it over with? Because before I'm done, you gonna get the job done. I'm not doing you it. You ain't got much sense, is you, girl? Come in here all mopey face. think I need saving? I'll spare you the mystery. No one can save no one except themselves. You ask me if anyone knows I'm here? Yeah? No one. Except Wanda and Eleven and them angels out there. Now, my question for you is, does anyone know you here? 
No. That's unfortunate. Nell unplugs Amy's phone from the power and puts it in her pocket. Now, you're not leaving here till you publish that there manuscript. Give me my phone back. I'll give it back when you finish the job. Just give it back. My, my grandfather, he needs to be able to get hold of me if... Please. When you're all done, I'll compensate you for your work. I'll even throw in a little extra for your commute and the unfortunate incident with the guy busting a nut. Then you'll get on that bus and go back to Seattle and forget you ever met me. You got that? Can I have my phone, please? Only had a few pages left to type when you come barging in here crazier than a shithouse rat. Now, when I finish typing, you're going to put your behind into that chair and publish my ebook. You got it? I'll do it if you give me my phone. <laughs> Where the hell you think I'd go, lady? In bumfuck Florida. In a hurricane. Just give me my phone. Nell puts the phone in the desk drawer. She locks the drawer and puts the key in the pocket of her sweatshirt. Now go sit down and don't give me no back talk. Nell sits at the computer and types. Amy stands frozen, unsure of what to do. Sit down. Amy sits. With laser focus, Nell types, a painfully slow and labored task. How'd you know I was on a reality show? Thought I told you to mind your business. Sorry. How'd you know? Because after we started emailing about my ebook, I looked your ass up on the interwebs. Oh. Found two of you on the Wikipedia. Amy Holt, the psychic in South Dakota, and Amy Holt, the transgender girl from some reality TV show that aired ten years ago. The eight and a half. Says you later published your tell-all book with Writer House. Self-published. and It's not a tell-all. And that now you're working for. Nell's nose starts to bleed. Uh, probably not anymore, seeing as I left town without telling anyone. Is your... Is your nose bleeding? Damn it, now. Nell takes a wadded-up Kleenex from her jeans pocket and holds it to her nose. Are you okay? I'm fine. You sure? Don't sit there gawking at me. I'm not. Give me some privacy here. Uh, I'm sorry. I said stop looking at me. Nell exits into the bathroom. After a beat, Amy goes over to the desk and tries to open the desk drawer. It's locked. Nell enters and takes her place at the desk. She types, slowly. Raindrops tap the window. Lights fade. End of scene. Scene three, a few hours later. Now, ladies and gentlemen, up here in our northern counties are experiencing a lull in activity as the large arm has passed by. But I urge you all to remain indoors as the next zone of rotation has yet to impact anywhere offshore yet. We have yet to experience the full punch of this landfall. There are many areas without power and those downed electrical wires are very dangerous and should be avoided until the FPL can deal with the aftermath of this storm. Sound fades during the voiceover as lights come up. Amy sits at the computer. Nell stands just outside the open motel room door, as if she's waiting for someone. The neon sign flashes. She swigs whiskey from a bottle. By rights, this belongs to my brother, Truman John Jordan. But I'm the only one who can tell it. What's that? You say something? No, no ma'am. Hatred has a name. The name is Willard Jordan. Nell enters. Well, don't just sit there staring at it like a dope. Why ain't you doing nothing? Who is Willard Jordan? I ain't paying you to read it. How long did it take you to write this? Not as long as it did to type. Well, like months? Years? I ain't been counting. Twenty years? What? Are you serious? So you were like... My age when you started it? Sorry. I shouldn't pry. Wrote it in some halfway shit house in Detroit. Oh, wow. What took so long to write it? When you're drunk and a dopehead, most of what you write don't make no fucking sense. Huh? So I started over when I ended up in this swampland. On the grocery bags? On my breaks at the Publix. When well, you didn't have paper? 
I only had ten minute breaks. Use what I could find. Why were you in a halfway house? Which time? Oh. <laughs> oh, baby girl. I slept in shelters, jail cells, and in the dirty, stinking gutter, and them's just some of the fancier spots. So you were like homeless. You looking down your nose at me? Because your life ain't been so rosy either, kid. Yours pretty much sucked before you even come out. You were born with the wrong parts, for Christ's sake. <laughs> if you ask me, that's something to be pissed off about. But you ain't complaining, and neither am I. <laughs> no, I've complained. Well, sorry as hell for myself. So how long you been homeless? Don't you be hurling judgments at me, girly. Only God does the judging, and I ain't got much use for him no more. I'm not judging. People have called me every form of every awful thing while I just been looking for something to eat or a place to shit or sleep. But not once I call myself homeless. How long? You've been uh, looking for a place to sleep. Don't know. Thirteen, fourteen. Like years or years old. Holy shit! How'd you end up in this place? When you've been invisible long as me and True have, sooner or later you end up in some hole, some rat hole, dope hole, or shit hole. So my brother is in his hole, and I'm here in mine. Next door to that Bible thumping raisin. Where I drink, I type, and I bleed. Now that I'm done typing, all that's left is the drinking and the bleeding. Well, maybe you should stop drinking. Maybe you should mind your business. Ever try meetings? <laughs> when you dance with the devil, too late to be surrendering to God. Don't care what anyone says. It doesn't have to be God. It can be like nature, positive energy, creativity. <laughs> Nice try, but don't none of that shit make me want to quit drinking. Sorry. What you apologizing for? All you folks making apologies like I'm some kind of tragedy, one to shine me up nice and pretty. You people is the worst of all. That white raisin Wanda in Eleven tries to shine me up, gets all up in my shit with her Bible rant. Kept coming over here with those five teeth, saying she here to give T.S. catnip, and then shoving a stinky old Bible in my face, calling it the good book. I told her she was welcome to think it's a good book, but I ain't read it, so I'll make up my own damn mind if it's a good book or not. <laughs> I worry about your soul, Miss Nellie. I pray for you, like I'm some kind of fucking charity case. That white bitch has five fucking teeth sticking out of her gums, only got a couple hairs left on her head, and she lives in a goddamn roach-infested motel room, and she looking down her nose at me? T.S. wasn't having it. <laughs> she squirted a little pee on that bitch. <laughs> That's awesome. Told her T.S. didn't mean no harm. She just wanted to leave a little something for you to remember her by, Miss Wanda. <laughs> Oh, one and eleven ain't come back since. <laughs> oh, only one person in my life ever shined me up where I didn't feel like a dope. Little east side kid named Susan. Lived all alone with her daddy. Pardon? An angel in a wasteland. Susan Radoski. She and her daddy didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, but she took me and Drew in and shined us up all nice. Why are you staring at me like that? Go on and get it up there. Amy's phone rings. They both stare at the desk drawer. It's probably my grandfather. I should probably get it. You can get it when you publish my manuscript. After a few tense beats, the phone stops ringing. My mom, she, she died a few years ago, so it's, it's just me and him since she passed away. Wanda's TV comes on. It was all over the tabloids and stuff after she died. Not that anyone cares about the neuter mother anymore. Sort of old news, you know? 
I had to put my grandfather in a nursing home. He, he can't be alone anymore, and I gotta work, so I found this home that's pretty cheap. Wanda's TV gets louder. It's funny. He kind of drove me nuts when he was around, but now it's like way too quiet without him around. I sort of miss him bugging me, you know? You kind of young to be on your own. Well, you've been on your own since you were 13. Yeah, and look how I turned out. Did you, like, run away or something? Sorry, that's... My ma died too, kid. I'm sorry. Told you stop apologizing. No, I mean, I'm... I'm just sorry things didn't go so good for you. And your brother. I can't figure you out. Can't figure out if you're some kind of saint or if you just got a head full of stupid. Pardon? Something's fishy about you. Only a white bitch take a bus 3,000 miles to drop in on a total fucking stranger. Can I ask you something? Seems like that's what you do. Who's Willard Jordan? Nell stares at Amy for a beat. There's a clap of thunder. The lights in the room flicker and go out. Wanda's TV goes mute. Shit. Ah! Wanda's gonna need to be sedated without no TV. Well, we're about to have no computer. What's wrong with it? Well, nothing yet, but you don't have much battery left. Well, what didn't you tell me? Because I didn't notice till now. Ugh, to 10%. Oh, fuck. Now what are we gonna do? She begins scratching furiously. Damn it! Jesus, are you... are you okay? I'm fine. Leave me be. The scratching is intense. Painful, frantic. Are you sure you're... I don't like you looking at me like you do. You make me uneasy with that face. Sorry, there's no face. This ain't some freak show like your reality television program. I'm just... Just g- turn around. What? You, you got wax in your ears. I said turn around, goddammit. Nell scratches wildly and rips her sweatshirt off, letting it fall to the floor. She exits to the bathroom. After a long beat, Amy picks up the sweatshirt and takes out the key to the desk. She opens the desk drawer and takes out her phone. Grandpa? Sorry, uh, my phone was dying. Are you okay? Are you taking your meds? Is there an aide around? Hey, listen, I, uh... I was right. It's her. Yeah, I'm sure. I've got to go. Amy hangs up and puts the phone in the desk. She locks the drawer, fumbling nervously with the key. She hears Nell coming and quickly shoves the key back in the sweatshirt pocket and throws it on the floor. Nell enters from the bathroom, picks up the sweatshirt, and puts it on. Still scratching slightly, she sits on the bed facing away from Amy. She takes a swig of whiskey. Amy tentatively sits at the desk and peeks at the handwritten manuscript. She slowly turns the first page. The lights fade. End of scene. Scene four, a few hours later. The power is still out in the room. The laptop is dead. The door to the room is still open. Thunder rattles. Light rain falls. Nell is on the bed, out cold. The half-empty whiskey bottle next to her. Amy sits on the floor with Nell's original handwritten manuscript in front of her. True and I remain there, safe from Willard, in Susan Radaski's room, where God granted us refuge with cats. For three days, my brother and I hid there from my uncle, hearing Susan read those strange poems aloud, while True slurped chocolate milk and wolfed down sandwiches with the crust cut off. Nell suddenly rolls over on the bed and knocks the whiskey bottle to the floor. Amy jumps. What time is it? I'm I'm not sure. Nell, you wake. Is the naming of people the same as the naming of cats? Asks True, a perplexed look coming off his six-year-old face. No, people only got one name given to them by their mama, I said. Not three names like them cats. 
But Susan didn't approve of my answer. Of course she get three names, she said to my brother. True is your sensible everyday name. And then you get a peculiar, more dignified name, like maybe, I don't know, Pumplestone. Pumplestone, said True, a gap-toothed smile creeping up his cheeks. But then there is the most important name of all, said Susan, the name that no one will ever guess, the name that only you will know and will never, ever tell. Fucking C.S. Eliot! Drew sat there, his brow furrowed, his nose scrunched up, thinking about his secret name. Maybe if I have a name that nobody knows, Willard won't be able to find us, he whispered. Susan took True's hand and smiled. My brother turned to me. I'll keep looking for my name, Nellie. That grin hopped back on his face. I'll find it. I know I'll find it. We should have stayed there. Huh? In Susan's room. I made him go back. Back to that monster. Amy turns the page and reads to herself for a moment, then quietly out loud. We'd been gone for three days. Willard was waiting for us, breath drenched in booze, eyes drenched in hate, fists clenched in rage. Amy reads to herself for a few moments. In her eyes, we see the reaction to the horror of what she's reading. I heard the popping sound of my brother's shoulder dislocating from the socket. I barreled into Willard, flailing, screaming from the highest part of my lungs. Willard balled his fist and took a step towards True. I can't read this. Then don't. The lights fade. End of scene. Scene five, a few hours later. Black clouds cloak the sky. The room is losing light. Nell is asleep. Amy hunkers down on the floor reading the manuscript, which is spread across the floor. I'm unable to recall every detail of the following evening when I return to Susan's. Yet my memory hovers over an odd jumble of objects. The faded green jeans I wore, the Crisco can stuffed with dollar bills, the torn edges of the linoleum floor in Susan's kitchen, the bloody hands of Jesus on the crucifix above the stove, and Susan's eyes as I walked out the door with the money I stole from that can. Come back tomorrow, Nellie, and bring True, she called out to me. When you get here, I want to give you something. What is it, I asked. It's a surprise. Why can't you tell me? Because then it wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, okay, I said, knowing full well I'd never see her again. Outside Susan's apartment, my brother crouched motionless on the sidewalk, finger-shaped bruises spread across his arm. I pulled the wad of money from my pocket. True, I called. He turned, his left eye swollen shut. In the half light of dusk, his open eye met mine with an ache that I knew I'd never fill. Thunder rumbles. Amy hunkers down closer to the manuscript. She turns the page. The lights fade. End of scene. Scene six, early evening. The storm outside is worsening. Lights up on Amy alone in the room. She's crouched on the floor, staring at the pages of the manuscript, scattered across the floor. After a long, breathless beat... Did all this stuff really happen? In the epilogue, when your grown-up says you and T.S. ended up on that beach in the Keys, did you ever really go there? The toilet flushes. You should have gone to the police about Willard. When you guys ran away and lived in that abandoned garage thing, I was so afraid he would come after you. 
Now, this is... You should write another book. Like, what happened next? Like, after True got mixed up with that gang? I mean, he was, what, 15? Did you see him after that? What she was saying? Jesus, like... Jesus, this book is, like, seriously amazing. You should have this published traditionally. You need an agent. People need to read this. Nell staggers out of the bathroom. What are you going on about? <sighs> Nothing. I just... I think your book will open people's eyes. I don't blame folks for closing their eyes. Because when your eyes is open, you gotta see shit. How about Susan? You ever try to find her? Nell looks for a portable lantern. Now why the hell you think I try and find someone I filch money from? Maybe she never knew you stole it. What? I'm sorry, but it a obviously... A lot of money in that can. How much was it? More than I'd ever seen. Oh, you were 13. Her and... daddy probably couldn't pay the rent after I stole it. Yeah, but like how much? Like I'm done talking about it. Nell finds the lantern and is trying to figure out how to turn it on. You shouldn't beat yourself up for something you did when you were... Who says I'm beating myself up? Well, you wrote about it, and now you're talking about it. No, you're the one talking about it. I'm just trying to figure out this damn lamp. You did what was right by your brother. You saved him. Just because we ran away don't mean I saved him. Might have gotten true away from Willard, but that kind of hate don't ever go away. Now pick this shit up. You should have gone to the police about Willard. And what, me and True end up wards of the state? Well, I'm glad you stole the money. That little girl took us in and fed us, filled my brother's head with something other than fear and hatred. And how'd I repay her? Susan was 12 years old, and she had more goodness than anyone I ever met. Yeah. And she made the best damn peanut butter and jelly sandwich I ever had. <laughs> That's because she got the crust on. Mm -hmm, that she did. Nell catches herself lost in the moment. She shakes it off and abruptly starts to pick up the manuscript. What you think this is? You think just because you read my shit that you can head shrink me? No, ma'am. Amy tries to help Nell pick up the manuscript. Nell snatches the pages out of her hand. Because I already told you, I don't like people in my business. Well, then maybe you shouldn't have written a memoir. Woman, you better hope that power come back on. I don't have time for this shit. Why not? It's not like you got a deadline. All right, you want a doctor fill my ass? How about I ask you a personal fucking question? Why'd you and your mama air your dirty shit for the world to see? What? That television program. No, I know what you... It wasn't like that. Then what was it like? But wait, I thought you didn't watch it. Didn't? Just want to know why you made a spectacle of yourself. To help people see that kids like me are just normal kids. I mean, like, cisgender kids. That's the Oprah version, baby. What? You think I'm bullshitting? I think that's the line of crap you tell folks to shine it up pretty. Now, why the fuck you go on there? I just told you. Don't think you did. Because I didn't want to go through puberty as a boy, okay? Is that what you want to hear? No, I don't want to hear about no fucking puberty. Well, you asked me a personal question, so I'm answering you. Born with the wrong junk. That shit will fuck you up. It's not wrong. It just doesn't fit right. Your bits and parts don't match your heart, so it's wrong. No, God. No. That, like, implies being trans is some kind of mistake rather than part of my identity. So you want to change your shit? Yes, but it's, not... but it's not wrong. Then what is it? It needs modifications in order to comfortably house who I am inside. Oh, baby girl, that shit's fucking complicated. Why are you trying to make it about body parts? Cisgender people what? are... What is this cisgender shit? Uh, it means people who believe there's a match between their assigned sex and the gender they feel themselves to be. Huh? Cis comes from the Latin term on the side of. Trans is the other side of. <laughs> oh, 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 shit, girl! It's not funny. 
whatever. It's like people like you want to put me in a box instead of like seeing me as a person who's, I don't know, normal, like fucked up and complicated and stuff. Oh, I see you, baby. And you look like a girl, but I know you stand up to take a piss. Are you being a bitch on purpose or is it because you can't help it? Baby, you just said it don't fit right. Which leads me to believe you was pretty fucking uncomfortable in the body you was born with. Most days I was uncomfortable or whatever, but it wasn't centered around, like, specific body parts. It was, like, really bad anxiety that wouldn't go away. And I knew the only way to eliminate it was to go on television with your shit. Was to modify this but uh, puberty blockers are super expensive so you let them make a freak show out of you can you stop just leave me alone so why'd you write some tell-all book that's not what it was because it seems to me you like to make a show of your private business it's not a tell-all jesus then what is it it's a memoir it was a tribute to my mom okay so people would know she wasn't the neuter mother. No one even read it. it sold like 30 copies. The just... way I figured, you and your mama was looking for attention with this reality television shit. Enough! Just get the fuck off my back! You need to hold your shit, girl. We couldn't afford the treatments, all right? Is that what you want to hear? My mom didn't have any money, so when she found out they were casting a family with a trans kid, and that they'd pay for the blockers, she, like, started sending emails to casting. Daily. She wrote book-length letters about my panic attacks. She finally flew to L.A. and went to the studio and waited there till someone agreed to meet with her. Now I see where you get this shit. You bitches just like to show up places. I think they cast us because Mom acted so nuts and they thought we'd make good TV. You and your mama do some crazy shit. Did. My mom did do some crazy shit. Why don't you just give me my phone? I just want to go. You ain't going nowhere till you finish getting that book up there. Then can we not talk about my mom? Please? Didn't all really go to shit until after it aired. That blonde woman from that current America show called our apartment all the time. Said it was like way too big a decision to stop puberty for your kid. <laughs> Mom told her to go F herself. Now I'd have fucked that bitch up. She messed with my kid. Bullshit. You wouldn't have done anything. Just like Mom and me couldn't do anything except sit there and take it. Got some scary shit in the mail. One guy wrote Mom these letters with all these pictures of devils and said she'd rot in hell for castrating me. All right, see, now this talk is nasty. Sorry, but geez, you're the one catching cockroaches in applesauce. Well, how else you gonna get them? Because let me tell you, them fuckers is tenacious. The power comes back on, as does Wanda's TV. Oh, phew. Okay, come on now. I thought we had an understanding about what you're here to do. Instead, you're over here talking about castration, and I'm about to lose my luck. Need to get some juice. I ain't got no juice. No, it needs. The computer. The battery. Wanda! I got company here, baby, so why don't you give us a break? What's wrong? You got a pinch look. There's no look. You gotta eat something. I'll make you some macaroni and cheese. In the kitchen area, Nell looks for a box of macaroni and cheese. I can't eat cheese. It's not real cheese. I'm vegan. Then I'll make you some soup. What kind is it? Don't worry, there won't be no cheese in it. Uh, as long as there's no meat in it. That's all any of you kids care about nowadays. No meat. Nell pours the contents of a can of soup into a pot and stirs it. You know, uh... Don't take this the wrong way, but this Whatever type... someone says some shit like don't take this the wrong way, you can be sure they're gonna take it the wrong fucking way. Well, don't 
take this the wrong way, but your title sucks. It doesn't fit the book, like, at all. It's really gloomy sounding. I ain't paying you to critique it. How are you paying me anyway? Where'd you get the money? Is it from working at Publix, or did you steal it? No, bitch, I ain't stole it. For someone who can write like this, you don't speak very good. I don't speak very well. And don't give me that look like I'm some kind of dope. I know how to speak. Well, this title sucks. He who was living is now dead. We who are living are now dying. Ah, it's way too long. And what's with the semicolon? He who was living is now dead. Semicolon. We who are living are now dying. From the Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. Well, he sounds like one miserable dude. Jesus. And you don't look like someone who would be into T.S. Eliot. And you don't look like someone who was born a boy. People is a lot of things, girly. You of all should know that. So don't you sit there spouting crap about what I'm supposed to read or not read, what I'm supposed to be or not be. If I want to read some shit written by a little white motherfucker a hundred years ago, it ain't for you to comment on. Well, can I comment on something else? I think you and True were brave kids. Kids? Ain't supposed to be brave. Supposed to be kids. With jungle gyms and blocks and shit. Instead, we was busy praying. Till I figured out that praying's another word for hoping. So, what's wrong with that? Hoping has a funny way of turning into disappointment. Jeez. I told True, told that boy to get off his knees and quit praying. Okay, wow, you really are depressed. I mean, you and T.S. Eliot ought to get together sometime. He's dead. Yeah, no shit. He who is living is now dead, semicolon. We who are living are now dying. I mean, God, no wonder you want to kill yourself. I'm beginning to agree with Wanda over there. I mean, I worry about you, Miss Nell. Who tells a five-year-old not to pray? <laughs> you didn't know true. He had a way of wishing for things. Always had that smile, always looking for that certain thing in this world, that thing that doesn't exist. So I told that boy to leave the praying part to me. Prayed so hard, I run out of ways to pray. For my mama died, I prayed so hard for her that my knees bled. She wasn't a welfare queen, you understand. She was a black woman who spent her entire life in the projects, which meant she was considered one of two things, a threat or invisible. My mom grew up in the projects, too. Didn't know they had projects in Seattle. She's not from Seattle. Well, your mama might have been a crazy-ass loon, but at least she looked after you. Uh, I put her through a lot of shit. Bet she gave you bubbly baths and read your stories about fairy godmothers and seven midgets and shit. My ma didn't read me no fairy tales. You want to know why? Because she didn't know how. That's right. Didn't know how to read shit. I tried to teach her. Try to give her something nice before she died. When God came to get her, I begged that caseworker not to make us go live with that monster. <laughs> but sweet Uncle Willard was blood. Only way me and True could stay together and not end up with two separate foster fucks. At least the prick had hot water. My brother would sit there for hours, holding his hands under the faucet, letting the water stream over his little fingers until that motherfucker poured boiling water over his hands for wasting hot water. Amy reacts with a wince. Aw, oh, now, come on, none of that. I ain't got tears left. Use them all up, so no sense you getting weepy about it. What happened to him? To Willard? Nell. Ah, uh, don't you worry about Willard. I just hope he paid for what he did to True. He paid, all right. And what he did to you was... Hey, I don't want to talk about that part, you understand? Okay. I'm sorry. Look, just... Just turn your behind back around and get back I'm trying. to work. Well, apparently not hard enough because that mouth of yours keeps firing. Look, it... It's... 
I'm gonna need to convert the Word doc to EPUB because it's not. Look, it's not my fault you have a shitty internet connection. You keep talking about some fucking internet connection for. This swampland ain't right for human habitation, let alone them interwebs. And in case I ain't made it clear, this is why I enlisted your services. Well, wait, it's working. It's converting. How long will it take? Once it finishes converting, I can upload it to Kindle. You better not be messing with me. I'm not. Shit the soup. Nell runs over and turns the stove off. After a moment... Amy stands and wanders over to the litter box, cat bowl, and cat toy. She kneels. Nell pours the soup in a bowl. She turns and gives the bowl to Amy. What are you doing? Amy picks up the threadbare toy. I don't know what this is, but I know there's a story behind it. Don't touch. What do you mean you don't know what it is? It's a mouse. <laughs> oh, uh, where are its eyes and ears? T.S. tore them off. Got the tail, too. <laughs> Jeez. That fucking thing can move, though. Uh, well, all right. Uh, give it a go. Go on. Amy flips the on switch on the mouse's belly. She sets it down. It makes a slow, lazy circle. <laughs> Needs a new battery. <laughs> It's kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where we laid our bones every night, T.S. sat there thumping his tail till I let old Mickey rip. <laughs> I'm starving, bleeding, and itching, and she's chasing a fucking blind mouse. <laughs> Been together a long time, me and T.S. In and out of them churchy shelters. Had my first run in with bed bugs in one of those dumps. Some priests with mild Tourette's kept telling me they were fruit flies, fruit flies. I said, you see any fucking fruit in here? T.S. slept out back with a mouse because he wouldn't let her inside. <laughs> but she let him know how she felt about the situation, snuck inside, and took a dump in Father Twitchy's rubber boots. <laughs> then she took off and left me and Mickey behind. But she found us again. Always does. Now, go wash your hands. Eat your soup while it's still hot. So did you ever make it to the Keys? Huh? In the epilogue, you ever go there? Thought T.S. would like to prance around in the surf, chase the starfish and shit. But you never went, huh? What? Did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. Oh, shit. Your nose. You're bleeding again. Nell hangs her head back, holding a Kleenex to her nose. The blood keeps coming. Jeez, are you okay? I'm fine. Can I do something? White people always asking some shit like, can I do something? Well, well, it's really bleeding bad. It's fine. Don't fuss. Are you sure? Get some paper towels. You want to do something. Amy looks around for paper towels. Uh, where? Over there next to the... Here? No, no, behind the thing. Right there. Amy finds the paper towels and hands them to Nell. Here, here you go. Promise me something. Yeah, what? If I croak while you're still here, you won't let Wanda in here to gawk at me. Wait, what? What do you mean if you croak while I'm still here? I don't want her looking down her nose at me. Promise me you won't let her in here. No, I I mean, yes, of, of course, but what's wrong with you? It won't be long before that raisin will be watching Real Housewives and she'll smell something ripe. Time she figures out what the stench is, the cockroaches will be mistaking me for the applesauce. What? I'm sick, girl. What? How sick? Like, really sick? Nell. Ah, death ain't nothing. It's part of life. We're all gonna die, baby. What's wrong with you? Liver disease. Cirrhosis. In stage. Is it because you drank? Mostly, yeah. Then why don't you stop? Because the only thing that stops the itching is the drinking. Can you get a new one? Liver? <laughs> now where you suggest I get it? From a donor? That shit costs money, kid, and there ain't no reality television show that's gonna pay for my new liver. <laughs> you might be surprised. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Because it ain't your worry, girl. So that's why you're gonna kill yourself. 
Now, you're the one coming here talking some crazy shit about me making away with myself. I may be a drunk who ain't never had so much as a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out, but I know death ain't something to play with. So you're not gonna- Now, come on now. Don't start with your weepy Wednesday number. Let's keep things upbeat. I just wish you'd told me. Death ain't nothing to fear, baby. True taught me that. He was six years old. Me and True went to my mama's wake. She looked all fresh and powdery laying there in a fancy coffin. She spruced up real good. True wasn't scared one bit. He gave me that smile, funny little gap in his teeth, and told me he liked the look of Ma's hand folded all soft and neat. Told me not to be sad because two angels in heaven was holding those hands. I asked him, why two? And you know what he said to me? He said, because she has two kids down on earth, so that meant she had two angels in heaven. Now, listen here, I need you to do something else. There's a letter in the desk drawer. Need you to mail it to True. Amy moves toward the desk. In here? No, 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 not yet. <laughs> you only gotta mail it if I go tits up. Okay, but what's, uh... Will you mail it? Yeah, of course I will, but what do you... You gonna do it or not? I will. No, I promise. And and just in case the money is under the mattress, you take it, all of it. I don't want it. You take that money, you hear? I told you, I don't want it. Use it to get your granddad into a better old folks home. I'm not taking your money. I said to take the goddamn money. Okay. Okay, just... I will, okay? Nell's nose stops bleeding. A long, quiet beat as she cleans herself up. What happened to True? Willard Jordan happened. No, I mean, how do you end up in... Ch I know what you mean, and I answered you. I don't mean to pry. Yeah, you do. Do you ever talk to him? White folks, you ever talk to him? Now, would you suggest we talk about the weather? Well, you know what I mean. Can you call him? What'd I just say, girl? Sorry. It had been almost 15 years since that monster did those things to us. Nell turns and looks out the window at the angels on the sign. True. Truman John Jordan. You should have turned around and walked yourself out of there. Fifteen years. But I suppose when evil come back, it don't matter how long it's been. So when True walked into that bar and saw Willa Jordan sitting in that corner booth, slumped over his Miller High Life, he had to go and... had to walk over to that booth. Had to... But I'll never understand why he didn't run off after he did it. He should have run away and not sat there, covered in that monster's blood, waiting for them to come and get him. It was like he wanted them to take him away. I went to visit him in that hole at least three times a week for nine years. And then one day I go in and he ain't there. Next day and a day after that still didn't show. Sat there in front of the plexiglass, staring at the phone, waiting like it was supposed to fucking ring. Week later, I get a letter. Said he didn't want me wasting my life visiting every day. Told me to get my shit together, quit drinking, and get the fuck out of there. Truth figured where there's a hell, there's an opposite of hell. Told me to leave the city and go someplace where the sun shined. Somewhere where life wasn't a wasteland. He made me promise. Find salvation. Ain't sure about no salvation. But I promised my brother I'd go. So for the first time in my life, I left Detroit. About a year and a half ago, me and T.S. hitched our way to paradise. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, traveling with a cat is no picnic. 
<laughs> kept getting booted out of people's cars. Took two fucking weeks to get from Detroit to Cleveland. T.S. kept jumping on dashboards trying to attack the windshield wipers. <laughs> oh, shit. When we finally got to the Sunshine State, I started bleeding pretty bad. Stopped here to get myself checked out. <laughs> First time in my life, I'm off the booze and I go and get sick. Got out of the hospital and got myself a job at the Publix up the road. Was pretty good at it. A working woman and stone cold sober. So that's how I ended up in bumfuck Florida, under them angels out there. So that part about the keys is... Life ain't happily ever after. But that don't mean I can't lie and make people think I had a happy end. Drew doesn't know where you are, does he? He'll know the truth when he gets my letter. No. Shit, no, you can't tell him. He wanted you to go someplace nice. What'd I just say? Life ain't all shiny and pretty. Go and wash your hands and eat your soup. Amy gets up and moves toward the bathroom. Just FYI, I think they're children. Huh? On the sign outside? Those are two kids, not angels. Amy goes into the bathroom. They're angels. They got halos and shit. Those aren't halos. That's a moon behind them. Without making a sound, Amy runs out of the bathroom, fleeing from a cockroach. Nell peers through the curtains. One of them's praying. They're angels. Children pray. Why the hell would Hills Lodge Motel have two little kids on the sign? Amy sits at the desk to eat the soup. Well, why the hell would they have angels? Because the little leprechaun who owns this shithole leans on Jesus. That's why. Um, are you sure this is vegan? Because that looks like chicken in there. Ain't no chicken. It's a potato. Are you sure? Oh, for Christ's sake, eat the soup. It's still preparing the file. Sorry, it's not my fault. I'm doing everything I can. Nell stands over Amy, gaping at the computer. There is a long beat. Amy looks up at Nell. What are you... Well, just staring at it won't make it go any faster. How I know you ain't fucking with me? What? You think I'm lying about the internet not working? How I know you ain't just telling me you're having technical difficulties? Maybe you is stalling so I don't go stick my head in the oven. I didn't know you had an oven. Don't be a smart ass. <sighs> Jesus, there's nothing I can do if... Ah, uh, okay. I guess I could design a cover. It's an e-book. Just leave it blank. You want to publish a book called He Who Was Living Is Now Dead? Semicolon. We who are living are now dying with a blank cover? You heard me. No cover. Really? Yes, really. But no fucking cover. Um, do you mind if we do something while the file prepares? What's that? Can I... Can I tweeze your eyebrows? Come again. Your eyebrows, I, I want to tweeze them for you. No, you can't fucking tweeze my eyebrows. What the hell's wrong with you? Well, don't take this the wrong way, but those things look like caterpillars. What do you care? Well, not even two caterpillars, just... One, just one big fat caterpillar crawling across your forehead. I ain't worried about it. Well, you can't go around with those things. Just let me... Amy takes a makeup bag out of her purse. She removes a pair of tweezers and reveals them to Nell. Oh, shit! I hate to think of where those things have been. Oh, come on, please. You ain't right, are you? They've been bugging me since I got here. See, this is why I should have kicked you out. You say you're here to stop me from offing myself, and the next thing I know, you're giving me a fucking bikini wax? Please. Bitch, you come near me with those things, and I'll fucking smack you down. <sighs> Fine. Wanda! You don't turn it down, I'll come over there and rip the thing out of the wall! Why don't you go pluck Wanda's chin? She got more hair on that chin of hers than her head. She all alone over there? Everyone's all alone at Hills Lodge Motel. <laughs> they should write that on the sign outside. Bunch of sad sacks, dope heads, and raisins ain't got two dimes to rub together. Drift into this hell hole and don't ever get out. Amy sits. I don't start with your mopey act. Is this because I won't let you pluck shit? Nah, I'm just... Uh, I think this soup is a chicken broth. I I can't eat it. You, you got anything else? Well, since you won't eat no cheese or meat, what the hell you want, a carrot? You got any? No, I ain't got no fucking carrots. I got saltines. Things so stale, you'll crack a tooth. 
Throughout the following, Nell hunts for the saltines. Wanda's TV can be heard faintly in the next room. How long has she been here? Old Wanda and Eleven. Why you gotta keep asking me about Wanda? Like, how long? Longer than you been here? Nell locates an old, sad-looking package of saltines and hands them to Amy. Tell you what, when you're done here, why don't you go past a Wanda like you've been doing me? Probably recognize you from your TV program. <laughs> oh shit, I'd love to see the look on that bitch's face. Probably think the devil playing tricks on her. Think she watched it? Don't know about that. Just know anything old Wanda and Eleven don't understand, she call it the devil. Oh, but she don't mean any harm. Was Wanda I got to thank for curing my blues? Thought I'd used up my tears and then one day I'm laying here thinking about True locked up. Thought I was going to lose my shit. Couldn't shake it. So I stuck T.S. in a backpack, knocked on Wanda's door, told her to take us to Jesus, to church. Why'd you take the cat? What do you mean, why'd I take the cat? Why the fuck not? <laughs> now I understand all her hoopla about the good book. <laughs> Those guys wrote some damn good stories. <laughs> what? Like fiction? The Bible? <laughs> Everyone smiling like dopes and singing the saints and shit. Even T.S. was mewing along. These people believe some shit so hard, Big Bird and his elephant pal could have come sashaying in there and no one would have bat an eyelash. <laughs> That's what faith is, like believing in something. Uh, lots of folks believe in shit. David Duke believes in some shit pretty hard. That's different. Ain't no different. Might as well excuse racism and fucking genocide with that logic because some asshole believes something? No, but I i mean, if people aren't hurting anyone... Tell that to all them jackholes sitting like lumps in front of TVs calling you and your mama... Uh, what was it you said? The neuter mother? That's not the same. Because I'd say those motherfuckers believe some things pretty goddamn hard. Stop. Don't you be telling me beliefs is harmless. Beliefs can be just as dangerous as weapons. Stop. Can kill just the same. Just shut up, okay? What the hell's gotten into you? I know what you're doing. What am I doing? You know, like, I told you so. I told you so what? Not a day goes by I don't hate myself for going on that stupid show. So I'd appreciate it if you don't try to teach me a lesson, okay? Girl, you need to eat something because now you're talking out of your head. The neuter mother. You got any idea how sick that makes me? Neuter, mother. Then don't keep saying it. She was the victim of so much bigotry. Contempt. Same thing. When I there, there was just all this hate unleashed. She cried all the time. Stopped eating and showering. I thought after the media died down that she'd snap out of it, but she kept getting more and more sad. Had her own shit going on. I turned my back on her. You were just a dumb kid. No. I was irritated. I'd hear her crying in her room, and I didn't... I went and watched TV. And when the crying got louder, I turned up the volume. She had all these bottles of pills next to her bed. Now, come on. Lots of people take pills for shit. I was binging the Gilmore Girls. By the time I found her, she'd been dead for seven hours. Jesus, kid. How you know it wasn't an accident? I don't. I'll never know. I'm not hungry anymore. I need to take a break. Manuscript is still... I just want to lay down to, like, rest my eyes for a few minutes. Amy stands and walks over to the bed. She gets on the end of the bed and curls up. It's lie... And no, you cannot. Come on, get on off the bed. <sighs> Nell begins turning down the bed. Can't sleep all balled up like an animal. Now get on in the bed like a normal person. Amy climbs into the bed and lies down. 
Wake me up if I fall asleep. Amy's phone rings in the desk drawer. They both stare at it. Nell unlocks the drawer and takes out the phone. She hands it to Amy, who quickly answers it. Hi, Grandpa. Are you okay? You taking your meds? Yeah, I'm still here. No, not yet. I gotta go. Wait, there's an aide there, right? Okay. Bye. Amy hangs up and hands the phone to Nell. Raindrops can be heard hitting the roof and window. Amy stares at the ceiling. Week before Mom died, I... I had my hearing with the judge to legally change my name to Amy. The whole thing took like ten minutes. The judge called me Amy Holt, signed the papers, and it was done. And Mom made the biggest deal out of it. She said my name like a million times that night. Amy Holt. Amy Holt. I told her it was just a dumb old name, and she didn't have to keep saying it. She said it was way more than just a name. It was a victory. And you know what I said? I said I didn't want to win anything. I just wanted to be me. And now I feel like hell for saying that to her because I realized she'd watched me suffer for so long that... For her, it was a victory. I wish I'd told her that she was right. That the name Amy is a victory. Do you ever wish you could tell your mom something? No use wishing for something that can't happen. I pray that mom knows that Amy is a victory. I pray. Amy is asleep. Nell stands still, watching her. She sets the cell phone on the bed next to Amy. She watches Amy for a moment. She sits at the desk and looks at the manuscript, uploading. My brother turned to me. I'll keep looking for my name, Nellie. That grin hopped back on his face. I'll find it. I know I'll find it. A hint of a smile, erased by the sudden feeling that her nose is bleeding. She takes Kleenex out of her pocket and holds it to her face. She lowers the Kleenex and stares at it. There's no blood. False alarm. She moves to grab the whiskey bottle, accidentally and unknowingly unplugging the laptop power. She pours a shot of whiskey and downs it. We hear the TV in eleven, just barely, as the lights fade. End of scene. Scene 7, many hours later, sometime after midnight. Rain and heavy gusts of wind rattle the door and the window. We hear the news broadcast from Wanda's television. People, I know it may seem like a lull in activity, but we have yet to really get into the thick of this storm. We have had this whipping wind and torrential rain from these relentless feeder bands, and now we advise you to hunker down as this storm will make landfall as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. Now's the time to get away from the windows and move to the interior parts of your homes. We can expect to be in the thick of it for up to two and a half hours as this storm is traveling quite Lights slowly. Lights up on Amy asleep in Nell's bed. The door to the motel room is closed. Nell, who is noticeably intoxicated, is looking for another bottle of whiskey. Amy's phone makes an emergency alert. <gasps> oh my God, how long have I been asleep? Five hours. Shh. Shit, why didn't you wake me up? Oh, I'm sorry. Nell frantically looks for the whiskey. Amy rubs her eyes, listening to the wind. Oh, it's pretty bad out there. What's the hold up with this thing? A loud clap of thunder. Amy moves to the computer. Jeez, I don't know what's wrong with the internet. Must be the storm. It's only at like 45%. Ugh, okay, so, uh, I still need to design a cover. Sorry, but I'm not going to leave it blank. How about a couple of kids in, like, a peaceful place, like 
an image of you in true somewhere by a lake or under a tree, maybe some birds. Ain't no fucking birds in my story. No, no you know what I mean. Ain't no trees either. Come on, it's not I like, don't like literal. It. I, it don't fit. Your story is about redemption and stuff. There's none of that churchy crap in my story. Nell scratches vigorously. No, not redemption from sins. Redemption from guilt. From life. I already know what God think of me. I didn't say anything about God. I was talking about redemption. Like finding peace, hope, and stuff. People need that. I do. What's hopeful about he who was living is now dead? Semicolon. We who are living are now dying. Well, not the title. It's a good use of a semicolon, I give you that. Damn straight. Hell, you got to be so hopeful about anyway. Your story didn't end so well. well. It's not over yet. Yeah, well, your mother's is. Shit, I shouldn't have said that. God damn it, for someone who claims to be suffering from the blues, you certainly manage to stay upbeat, don't you? Well, maybe if you stopped drinking that whiskey crap, you'd see something nice in this life. Lightning flashes. Nell claws at her skin, scratching furiously. You want to know why I drink? You want to know why? Because I want to rip my skin off. I want to tear it off my bones and climb the fuck out. Well, so do I. You think I don't want to climb the fuck out, huh? I spent my whole stupid life trying to climb out of this. This. Amy's phone makes another emergency alert. It was because of my mom that I... When she died, I just... I feel so fucking guilty because I didn't ever thank her for... If it weren't for her, I wouldn't have been able to climb the fuck out. And you come along, I I meet you, and I feel like... I ain't your mama I can't again. lose you. Oh, shit, girl, you ain't right, are you? Got a touch of the crazy in you, just like your mama. I'm not who you think I am. Yeah, no shit. You wear a dress to hide your boy parts. But ain't no getting away from who you are, just like I ain't getting away from this fucking liver that's killing me. Maybe we can find a donor. You gotta get off that kick. No, I mean it. Have you ever tried? Amy, please, don't. No, really, there are organizations that provide financing for organ transplants. It's worth trying, at least. Come on, kid, don't get your hopes up. How long? How long what? Have you got? How long have you got to live? Until you put the book up there. What? That's it. I don't want to be a part of this. I'm done. Well, it's too late. You're already part of it. A thunder crash, and the lights in the room go out. The computer screen flickers off and goes dead. What just happened? What's wrong with it? it it's dead. Stop doing that. You have to wait till the power comes back. If you hadn't been so busy, run in your mouth and be up there already. Now, help me get it done, or I can't... You can't what? Die? A clap of thunder, and the lights come back on. Nell hits the keyboard. It's still dead. You gotta help me. Please help me. Just help me. Amy walks over to Nell and gently takes her hand away from the computer. Stop. Amy plugs the power cord in. You need to give it a minute to let the battery charge. Just wait. Nell grabs Amy's hand and clings to it. Don't leave me. I won't. What if it don't come back on? It will. Just wait. They wait. Nell sits motionless, slumped over the desk with her head buried in her hands. Amy picks up her purse. When you first emailed Ryder House and said your name was Nell, I didn't think anything of it. But when you called me that night you've been drinking, you said your brother's name was True. You kept saying, True with an E. But, uh... <laughs> I still wasn't completely sure till I got here and you said your cat was named T.S. From her purse, Amy removes a book that looks to be very old. The spine worn gently. The title faded on the cover. She sets the book in front of Nell. What is this? This book? I can see it's a book. By T.S. Eliot. Why are you giving it to me? My mom 
gave it to me when I was little. But I think it belongs to you. Nell stares at the book. A ghostly, quiet shock slowly washes over on her face. What is this? Is this... How do you... 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 You're Susan's... How is this? Mom said when she was 12 years old, she had a friend named Nellie who had a little brother who loved a poem in this book. She said the poem made him think about his secret name. And that one day Nellie and her brother disappeared and that she never saw them again. That's all she ever told me. Did she... Tell you that the kids in school call me Smelly Nelly? No. She never told you she hid us from Willie? No. Because he beat on my brother? No. And that I went and stole from her pop? No. Maybe you should look inside. No. Just look. Nell opens the book and stares at the inscription on the cover page. June 25th, 1989. To Nellie. I pray that you and True are well. I pray that you have found light and joy, and that True has found his name. Love, Susan. My mom. An angel. In a wasteland. Death. When you live an invisible life, you don't expect people is going to remember you. Nell gently pushes the book away from her. I don't want this shit, but get rid of it. No! Nell picks up the book and throws it at Amy. Get it out of here. You, get out. What? You heard me. Take your book and get the fuck out. Nell, why? No, please, don't. I don't want you in my business. You understand? Get out. What are you doing? Get the fuck out. I'm sorry. No more sorry. I'm sorry that you're bleeding and that you itch and that you're in pain. Get out. I'm sorry that your uncle hurt you. Shut up. And that he did those things to your brother. Stop it! And that you live here all alone and that your cat ran away and that True is in jail Get and it... the fuck out! Amy picks up her suitcase and heads toward the door. The sound of a computer booting up. Amy hears it, stops, and looks at the computer. Nell follows her gaze and then moves quickly to the computer. Amy sets her suitcase down. Nell hits the keypad. No, 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 something's wrong with it. I don't understand what it's asking. It's flashing something. What do I do next? No. Help me. You gotta finish the job before we lose electricity again. Come with me. God damn it, help me! No. Let's go. To the keys. Help me. Please, I beg you. You can't stay in this place. Amy starts to grab Nell's clothes out of the drawers and stuff them in her suitcase. I don't know what it's flashing. Why is it doing that? Just forget it. What are you doing? Let's go. Come with me. Let's write True a new letter. Let's mail it from the keys. Stop it. Stop touching my shit. You can't mail it from here. Not this place. Let's get out of here, please. Now listen to me. I need you to do this tonight. Do you understand? I paid you to do it, and you need to finish this thing tonight. Okay, okay. Just please don't... Do it! Why is it so urgent that we do it tonight? Because... Because why? Because I don't want my brother to disappear. No. No one will know he was here. No, no. That's not true. It's like he didn't even exist. Oh, my God, no. We've been invisible our whole lives, and now we're just gonna disappear. Nell wilts to her knees. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Amy drops down next to Nell. She reaches for Nell, who cowers and pulls away. <sighs> Amy cautiously wraps her arms around Nell and holds her, rocking her. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to publish your book. I will. Okay? I will. 
But can I do something? No, you cannot pluck my eyebrows. <laughs> can I change that horrible title? To what? I don't know. Anything. Something else. All right. You promise? Yes. Amy rises and takes her place at the desk. Slowly, she starts to type. The lights fade. End of scene. Scene 8. Early morning, daybreak. The lights come up on Amy, slumped over the desk, asleep. Nell, sober, sits dear still on the end of the bed, staring out the open door into the rising sun. She holds T.S.'s robotic mouse. A bag is at her feet, packed with clothes. The computer makes an upload complete sound. Amy wakes. Oh, my God. It's done. It uploaded successfully. So it's up there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. It's done. The book. The e-book. It's done. Your mother didn't kill herself, kid. You should know that. What? How do you know that? Because I knew her when we were 12 years old. And there's no way in hell that little girl took her own life. But how do you know? Because she had more guts than any human being I'd ever known. Until you. Amy starts to cry. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. T.S. <laughs> Eliot. His poem. The Wasteland is about someone searching for redemption that he never finds in a world that provides no shelter. <laughs> Seriously, you, you got to stop reading that shit. What if he's right? He's wrong. What if there is no judgment? What if we, our souls, our lives are never redeemed. What if all the blood and shit and scum of everything is a part of us? What if... If it makes us who we are and leads us here to this exact moment? Maybe all the prayers are never heard and the hoping is hope for the wrong thing. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. All this time I've been hoping that funny old cat would find me again. But now I realize it wasn't the cat I was hoping for. It was you. Do you want to see it? Your book? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm sure. Nell flips the switch on the mouse's belly and places it on the floor. It scoots across the floor. <laughs> Amy laughs. laughs. Let's go. To the keys. Nell stands and lifts the bag over her shoulder. She walks over to the desk and takes the letter to True out of the drawer. She stops and looks at Amy. Are you coming? Yeah, yeah. Just give me a minute. Nell picks up the book that Amy gave to her. What about the rest of your stuff? Leave it. What about the computer? It don't belong to me. It belongs to some kid. <laughs> Nell exits. Amy looks at the published manuscript on Amazon. She smiles. Naming True, a memoir by Nell Jordan. Amy unplugs the laptop from the power and picks it up. She places the computer on the bed, open, facing out. She picks up her purse and her suitcase and looks around the room. She smiles. She starts to exit. 
She stops. She turns and walks over to T.S.'s mouse. She picks up the mouse and holds it for a beat. A smile. Amy exits with the mouse. On the computer, we see the cover of Nell's published book, two children walking hand in hand toward an enormous moon. Under the image, Naming True, a memoir by Nell Jordan. End of play. This has been a production of Play for Keeps. Thank you for joining us.